more often than not, they will book people under the provisions that invoke the idea of obscenity. So it also means that in India, which is a country where homosexuality is outlawed, if somebody who is of alternative sexual identity or gender orienti or sexual orientation or gender identity goes and tries to tell the police, the police can even book them. The victim can be booked, right, for this. So there's a problem with the language of these uh, provisions. And also the police doesn't understand multi-layered consent in its full dimension. So they think that if you shared an intimate picture once and that other person put it on the net without your uh, permission in what is like, you know, to use a controversial term, what is called revenge porn, these things cannot be booked under privacy. I have to use only the obscenity provision. So this is the dominant thinking of law enforcement as well. And finally, if you, there is no, no provision that deals with sexist speech that is not sexually explicit. So we have hate speech laws, but they don't look at gender-based hate speech. And most of trolling is in the nature of generalized misogynistic abuse. And it will be very difficult to apply pre-existing provisions like direct criminal intimidation. So this is one of the problems that we have. And also, recently, India passed a, a very unique Supreme Court order which struck down a generalized harmful communication provision because it was too broad in its language. And this provision basically said that any speech that is grossly offensive, that, that is punishable. And this used to be invoked earlier by uh, women facing violence and a range of other things. But predictably, this was also used by a political elite to shut people in opposition. And it became something that was a violation of free speech. And because it was seen as a arbitrary, excessive, and unconstitutional restriction of free speech, the court struck this provision down. And while striking this down, it also said that our earlier uh, regime of like intermediary liability, where we had a notice and takedown approach, that will not hold anymore. But now you have to wait for an executive or judicial order before you take down anything, if you are an internet intermediary. And this leaves women who are facing like very grave problems, like if a woman is raped and her video, the video of that rape is uploaded or sold online, this is a growing problem, a very serious problem in small towns in India. There's nothing she can immediately do to ensure that the video is uh, taken down. And uh, finally, I just want to say two things because we are trying to think here about what kind of an approach do we want to, I mean, provide redress for this issue. So I think that we should approach the issue of uh, online violence against women and frame it as harm that violates a woman's dignity and right to privacy. And the right to privacy has to be understood as consisting of a triumvirate of bodily integrity, informational privacy, and the privacy of choice. I mean, we need laws that are rooted in such an approach. And then law enforcement officials must be sensitized so that we no longer talk about genuine victims of things like financial fraud and victims without common sense in the case of a woman who happened to be in a relationship. And that's the language they yeah. use, and this has to change. And we need social support that ensures that victims are not stigmatized because they come out with their story. And finally, we need to think about an approach to intermediary liability, which ensures that without kind of like privatizing censorship, we also ensure that victims of online violence have a first step uh, of like recourse. And how do we effectively balance the freedom from violence, the right to that, and free speech for all? And I think this really is the crux. And how do we go towards this? This is something I would like to ask everyone in the room. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nandini. Had me already taking copious notes. Uh, I'll hand over to Tai Tai to give us a perspective from Myanmar, um, where we were just discussing earlier that almost everything is just happening at once as everybody gets online, new um, uh, cultures being cultivated. What's, what are you seeing happening in Myanmar? Hello. Um, yes, um, thank you for um, letting me to be uh, on this panel. So I would like to uh, reflect on the country context, uh, and uh, I would like to share about the two very, um, um, I mean, th the two most important um, um, problems in uh, regarding with uh, with Myanmar. Mm -hmm. So uh, Yan Nigeria is right. Um, Myanmar is the um, 
um, Myanmar was the greenfield for uh, mobile uh, and internet. And right now, um, last uh, two or three years ago, we had um, just uh, less than 10% of people um, having uh, connected to internet. But right now, um, more than 90% uh, of the country's populations have coverage to the internet. And we have more SIM cards than the number of people in the country. So it's definitely, um, the, um, the, the accessibility is definitely um, uh, growing. But the problem is, um, do women have the same um, as, um, accessibility as, as, as as the rest. So um, I would like to reflect on uh, one of the um, 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 one of the research that we did in 2015 and 2016 with one of our partner called Land Asia. So it is a nationally uh, representative survey that we collected from 12,000 people. And what we see is there is a digital um, divide in mobile phones ownership and. Um, and it has been around 28% in uh, both 2015 and 2016. So although the, um, the, uh, the number of people that are coming up online are increasing, the digital divide it's, uh, is still there in terms of men and women. And also uh, when looking at that, um, uh, comparing to countries like um, India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, uh, in culturally, Myanmar women have, uh, have uh, are um, known to be uh, much more, um, uh, much more, uh, uh, much have much more uh, decision making level in their in the in their um, uh, at at home. So um, so in our uh, in our um, uh, in our surveys that we also did, we also find out that uh, women are giving a strong place to actually make a financial decisions in the family. So when it comes to um, the um, uh, internet and mobile, what happens is that um, when women, when asked whether, you know, if she would like to spend her money on, t uh, on, on groceries or on the, um, on the top up for the mobile phones, definitely there are a lot of more women who said that their money that they have will definitely go to the um, um, to the groceries buying rather than buying phones and mobile phones and 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 top up, top ups in the country and so the so and on the other hand um, women uh, first have uh, access uh, barriers of access um, regarding with income and also barriers of access that you know um, um, barrier of access um, in terms of um, in terms of the uh, the cultural um, cultural um, um, culture in the country as well. So that's that's the first problem. Accessibility is uh, not actually uh, coming up uh, as high as the meant. And number two is, um, so that's the quantitative survey that we did. And another one is the, um, the qualitative survey that we survey on digital rights to uh, more than 100 of people. And in the groups, there were men, women, and transgender people in, the, in our sample as well. And when we saw that even when online, women face different types of problems and therefore have to dif uh, behave differently to men because of these problems. For example, women are harassed online with um, so in in the in the um, in the in the interviews of the survey, we we see a lot of women say that they ha they are harassed online. For they have uh, they have uh, texts that uh, uh, they receive text messages. For example, uh, comments that like uh, can you lift up your skirt and send me a picture from strangers. And women also repeatedly say how images of women are photoshopped into nudes and edited their bodies to show them. And then, and then many women also told us that they don't post pictures of themselves online and only post photos of their faces and only post photos uh, when they are taken photograph as a group so that they think that it is much more unlikely to get photoshopped. So women have a um, perspective on that. And also women also use men identity that is having a ma male name or, or, um, or when signing up for a Facebook account, they take the um, box as a male to, because they, they felt that when they are, um, they are online as, as, a, as a male, they, they will not get harassed uh, when, when they come online as, uh, as a woman. So, um, so, so this is very, um, 
very interesting because men that uh, in the interviews would never mention about this is something that they do, you know, taking a persona of a woman because of they were scared of harassment. And also uh, women often, when uh, when they are having, a, for example, a Facebook profile, women often post a pic photo of their husbands and their kids in their profile photos because this is a way of signaling to the world that I'm a woman, but look, I'm, I'm married and I have a child to, you know, to, to resist from uh, getting harassed. And also, uh, women also, for example, don't open uh, account themselves, and they just use their husbands or their brothers or their son's Facebook account to actually get uh, much more information. So these are two of the biggest concerns in the country, which is number one is accessibility. is not actually in increasing, and there's a very big digital divide between uh, men and women. And the second is uh, the perspective of online and you know gender-based uh, harass and violence only happening to women, but, but not in the other gender. So that's, that's what I would like to share. Thank you so much, Tai Tai. Just reminds us that some of this, what we're seeing online is always just an extension of norms that have existed offline and how do we use the spaces once we occupy them to bridge those two inequalities, if you will, at the same time. I'll now hand over to Amalia to give us a perspective on, from the work she's been doing in Colombia. Thanks, Amalia. Thank you, Nanjira. Uh, well, my name is Amalia Toledo. I'm from Carisma Foundation in Colombia. We are a digital rights advocacy organization, and since a few years, uh, we have been working on, on gender issues. Uh, we started working on uh, gender-based violence online, uh, but we have broadened it a little bit more just uh, to have a more, um, I guess, to bring a more positive view on the issue. Uh, now we are working on um, women's rights online with the uh, Web Foundation, and we have done several I projects that, that if you wanted to know all about, you can come to me. Now I'm gonna focus on the context of uh, Colombia in this issue on gen uh, gender-based violence online. And this is something that we have done for the submission, the call for submission that uh, um, the special reporter on, gen on violence against women just uh, closed a few weeks ago. Uh, but we also have done something more regional with other uh, similar organization and friends organizations uh, that Joanna will talk a little bit more later. Uh, but in, in the case of uh, Colombia, we can say that the Colombia legal system has shown significant progress in terms of recognizing women's rights and overcoming the discrimination of violence that we face in different areas of our life. Uh, it also has shown significant progress in developing norms that promote gender equality and safeguard women's rights. Even the judiciary has also had an important normative tra treatment regarding the recognition of historical and structural discrimination against women in the effective promotion of equality and the eradication of discrimination against women. Uh, even in the context of the recently adopted peace agreement, uh, significant and thorough work ha was done to take into account the particular situation of women in the context of, com in the, context of the conflict and the post-conflict. Ah, despite this level legal development, <laughs> there is still a significant gender gap in the practice. Uh, many factors can explain this gap between standard and practice. However, we can highlight as one of the main causes the persistence of patriarchal social-cultural schemes on unequal powers, uh, relation between men and women, and a structural problem that permeates all society and its institution. And the rates of violence against women each year show that the problems still lack effective response from the state. Without going into the details and figures, I can assure you that these uh, rates make it clear that gender inequality persists and the violence against women is a serious problem in the country. But if we try to investigate about digital violence against women, we find a significant, even greater gap when it comes to statistics. Uh, current norms on violence against women still lack state-defined digital approaches, approaches and strategy and this is a major challenge because ICT, especially the internet, is a field of tension for the enjoyment of women's rights. To try to understand and provide evidence about the consequences of digital violence that women suffer, in 2015 we worked with a group of female journalists to make a preliminary diagnosis of the situation. One of the conclusions of this project is that digital violence is 
often underestimated and its effects and also its effects are under, underestimated by authority platforms and even the same victims. In fact, we were able to see uh, that the attacks can even materialize in physical world. Uh, physical violence, changes in journalistic practice, loss of economic income, etc. But it also has psycho-emotional effects manifested in high level of anxiety and stress. It's also worth noting that in many cases we established that one consequence was self-censorship. These women simply stop expressing themselves online to avoid the wave of violence. Thus, we identified that the gender-based violence suffered by these women did have real consequences in their life, often usually unrecognizable by their close environment, the authorities, or the victim themselves, and, and they are lacking of effective responses, remedy, and solutions. Although there are some types of criminal offenses, uh, although there are some time, types of criminal offenses defined in the Colombia legal framework, framework to combat digital violence against women, I can mention like abuse, access to computer system, personal data, uh, uh, infringement, sexual harassment, and many others. The reality is that they are designed to criminalize computer crimes at the macro level from, from a more corporate perspective. On top of that, the reality shows there is a high rate of impunity and a lot of re-victimization in women, whether it is from the platforms or authorities. That is, women are victims of violence. <laughs> women who are victims of violence, they do not report for, personal, for fear of personal and social repercussion or because they ignore their rights. But when there is a complaint to the comp competent authority, there is high probability, probability that the victim will be ignored or re-victimized. This is because there is no proper protocol of action or basic understanding of technology by law enforcement or the judicial system. This scenario, undoubtedly, makes it difficult to have a system of case records or to ensure that there is an effective, effective sanction against those who attack, especially when they are identified when they, when they are already identified or can be identified. On the other hand, digital platforms where many of, of these violence of course, also are very inconsistent in their way of acting against uh, claims or reports of digital violence. As I've shown, the reports in this case, in the case of the Colombian state, although <coughs> may be considered ineffective, uh, with an absence of a gender-based approach that can inform and help to find more sensitive and effective solutions. But on the other hand, it's true that finding a solution, an effective remedy, is not an easy task. So we have a lot to discuss. Thank you so much, Amalia. Always a reminder that you can have it in law, but breathing life into the law is a whole other matter. I'll now pass over to Joanna to give us uh, perspectives on great work they've been doing in trying to address this issue from Brazil and beyond. So if, if we could put the first link, yeah. So in Brazil, uh, we work together with uh, a group of uh, organizations, uh, women from different fields, from lawyers that are doing, are doing support, uh, feminist lawyers or uh, activists that have been targeted for online uh, hate. And and many organizations, feminist organizations that were not uh, connected or discussing digital rights, but had a lot of input to put in the conversation. Um, in this report, we, we managed in the beginning to do uh, typography, a uh, typology of different cases uh, of attacks. So if you could pass to the next tab the second tab, the other, the other, next one, next one. Thank you. If you could just click view graph. And um, the goal here was trying to understand uh, how a different attack uh, could uh, lead to many aspects or legal aspects 
of crimes or violations, no? and uh, and first also to to map all the attacks because we just as other kinds of violence against women, there is a need to recognize sometimes of actions as violence as well, and of course there are different degrees of damage, but we wanted also to collect all the, the attacks and manifestations of violence that those people were um, suffering. Uh, we also did uh, another report for Latin America with partner organizations like Carisma and other friends, and both in the Brazilian report and also in the Latin America report, even though the, the cases and the diversity was very different, like from in Brazil, the issue of race was very eminent in many cases that we collected. Um, then in other countries in the region, uh, the issue of race and issue of uh, sexuality, like in Brazil, if you're a trans person, we are in the top uh, ranking of uh, horrible ranking of killing transgender people in the country. So of course, the the, the online violence is a continuation of the offline violence. And uh, in Brazil, those three issues were uh, very uh, latent in all the cases that we collected to do the map and so. This is also the the Latin American report. So. Uh, I want to just, uh, in those reports, we have uh, cases documented and the problems that we find to solve them, analyzing through two lenses, one, the public sector, and then the responses from the private sector. Uh, we found that the issue of, of access to justice, but also uh, the continuation of the problems that we have with again, offline gender-based violence and online, that you go to the, the, the police and they will, will, ask, will not have any training, not, not only on digital rights, but also on um, uh, dealing with gender-based violence. So for instance, there was one case that a person had one of her peak, uh, was being suffering a menace for, for revenge porn. I don't like that term because it's not porn and it's not revenge. But uh, so the girl was uh, being a menace? Yes, menace. And so she went to the police and the police, okay, give me the photos. And she was like, no, I don't want to give you the photos because then I'm going to be exposed to you. So it's like, Re-victimizing is also a trend. So we find it very hard, the legal solution in one hand, uh, just as many other issues related to gender violence. In Brazil, there is a ton of legislation being proposed, uh, focused on gender and digital, and exactly on gender violence. And we have classified those legislations and they are mostly bad and also seen as a way to criminalize uh, conduct that in the end, who's going to jail is gonna be again, just the poor people, you know, so even a woman from uh, low income and the communities would say, no, this, this is not the way, we don't wanna put our boys in jail. So that was also one uh, interesting remark. So then, Moving to the solutions to the private sector, and to wrap my, my interaction, um, we saw that one, there was a massive feeling of impunity in one hand, and in the other hand, a massive feeling of censorship, because also many uh, feminists and collectives uh, produce uh, the way of communicating in the feminist agenda also uses body a lot. Mm -hmm. So then there is a conflict with uh, the moral of the platforms that we use um, because they are based in the US First Amendment of freedom of speech. It's, it's not as balanced as in other countries like in Brazil. 
uh, you like even we had a picture it's an old case but we had a picture from the minister of justice that was blocked because uh, the minister of culture that was blocked because it was an indigenous person not wearing clothes but it's a piece of art so so it's not balanced in our moral standards in one hand but in the other hand uh, it's not balanced with hate speech because it, the first amendment is so supreme but in Brazil racism is a crime so there is a need then I pass to the, the recommendations so there is a need the first recommendation is to contextualize so there is a need to to contextualize those terms of sa services with uh, the, the culture, but not only, also with a view on gender and an intersec intersectional approach to gender that considers <coughs> race and, uh, and all. Um, also the team that is analyzing the content should be aware of these uh, cultural differences and w capable to work on cases of violence against women, or not only women, on online gender violence. There is a need to balance, always. Uh, so the platform needs to be committed to, to address the issue, but not become a tool for censorship or to uh, uh, prevent anonymity and the protection of privacy. Uh, clarity and accessibility of the terms of references and ways to redress it. So the tools to denounce should be easy to find. Uh, there was this case that um, uh, Acoso Online, which is a platform in Latin America that uh, analyzed a lot the terms of references and the ways that platforms are giving people to redress attacks. And they found out that the f denounces for, again, revenge porn uh, in brackets in, in many platforms have several paths. Either you can denounce it <coughs> under a privacy allegation or under porn or copyright. So it's confusing. It's not naming properly what's going on. It is non-consensual share of uh, intimus images. And then it's hard to find a solution. So clarity. And then due process. Uh, meaning that people need to have the right to appeal if a content uh, has been taken down because we have due process in the legal procedures with engaging with government, but with the platforms, we don't. Uh, so if your content has been censored, you should know why and maybe appeal. Um, in many cases it happened, but just because they reach us or other organizations in Brazil that have access to a person in a particular platform, and that's not the right way to, to solve it. Um, but also there in concerning due process, there is a need to have a clear information about the processes, the criteria for decisions, the time frame, so we're trying to address this feeling of impunity. Like why, why my content has been removed but I'm being attacked by the person under a racist attack. So we have more clearance on that. And then transparency, it would be great. The platforms already have transparency reports but uh, only about uh, requests from uh, the government to take down content, we would like to know. Uh, how many cases of gender-based violence are leading to take down content, or how many cases of feminist uh, content being taken down under moral allegations. Um, and then consult and educate. It would be great to have more spaces to engage with the platforms to address uh, the solutions that they are taking. I know that Facebook implemented a hash for um, content photos that uh, have nudity, but then you need to also give your nude pictures and to, to Facebook, that. and so it's weird. And maybe if you talk more with the community, that weirdness would sh show up earlier. And educate, like uh, promote 
and help people to promote campaigns against gender-based violence and always remembering that uh, there is a, a cultural diversity and context. We cannot do an universal campaign because also the forms of attacks uh, varies a lot according to the context. So thanks. Thank you so very much, Joanna. Um, Karuna, as I hand over to you, you've, you've heard a lot from various perspectives and many more, I'm sure, throughout IGF and uh, elsewhere. You know, a platform like Facebook, where this could be argued as a primary site where a lot of this is playing out, how are you guys going, uh, going about addressing these issues? Thank you so much for having me, you know, as part of this discussion. And, you know, that's a really good segue for me to come on board. So thank you for setting the stage. Um, so my name is Karuna Nen. I manage global safety policy programs at Facebook. I also speak really fast because I'm from India and, you know, Indra, you'll agree with me. So if you need me to slow down, just let me know and I'll try and slow down. Uh, I might forget again. You might have to remind me again, <laughs> but it's an ongoing process. <laughs> So let me talk about broadly, and uh, I apologize for people who may have heard me say this through the day, but how do we really think about safety and about keeping the community a safe place on Facebook? We try and take a five-point approach. First, we want to make sure that we have policies in place that very clearly define what people can and cannot share on our platform. And a great example is our nudity policy. Now, we have people coming to Facebook from many different cultures, speaking many, many different languages. Uh, you know, what my sense of, you know, acceptable nudity may be very different from, you know, what yours is. And how do we really balance this out and make a place where everybody and anybody feels like they can come and connect? It's a huge challenge. Over the years, we've got a lot of great feedback. We've taken some of that feedback into account. So, for instance, now, we would be allowed, you know, we would have that photograph which you talked about, which we made, a, you know, which we took down many years back. Uh, because it is a culturally, you know, it's a conversation that you all want to have in society. Uh, we do allow photographs of women breastfeeding, for instance. But we don't allow complete, complete nudity uh, on the platform because we have people from different cultures, we have minors on the platform, so we don't allow complete nudity. Now, when I do speak to some women activists, they tell me that this policy isn't in the right place because we are just, you know, propagating many patriarchal norms. Why shouldn't women be allowed to show their breasts on the platform and men be allowed to have a bare torso? It is a conversation that we have. Right now, because of various reasons, we don't allow complete nudity, but this is something that we are constantly talking about, constantly trying to evaluate where's the right place for our policy to sit on. And we keep, you know, as the discussion keeps going, we might amend these policies. I'm not saying that we're going to allow nudity on the platform right now. What I'm saying is that this is an ongoing conversation with many different people around the world to help us understand where the policy should sit. Uh, the second pillar of our safety uh, you know, philosophy is making sure that we have the tools in place. This includes back-end tools, which we run to try and keep the platform safe, keeping out certain content, but also you know, tools to give you the control on your experience. Who do you want to connect with? Who do you want to share with? What are you seeing in your newsfeed? We want to make these tools as easy to understand for people. Over the years, we've got a lot of feedback that some of these tools got a little confusing, especially on the privacy and the security side. So we created these one-stop checkups. So if you go to our safety center, facebook.com slash safety, on the left-hand panel, you'll be able to launch something called a privacy checkup. It's a one-stop shop where you'll be able to go back, check who you've been sharing with, what have you been sharing, change the settings for some of those posts because you may not want to share those with the whole wide world anymore. Similarly, we have a security checkup. Over the years, we've changed our tools as we become more sophisticated as a platform. We now allow people to have two-factor authentication. We have other tools that we've built in to try and give you more security on your account. And this is a place <coughs> where you can go and check on the security of your account, make it stronger. I'm not going to go into more detail. There is a bunch of things that I could keep talking on these two pillars, but I want to talk about the third one, which is help and resources. Because a lot of times, people don't even know that there are certain tools or certain you know, uh, ways that they could be approaching us for help and support. If someone has shared an intimate image of yours without your consent, you don't know what to do, you should be able to go somewhere and get that information. Why does it look different on Facebook versus other platforms? How can I get my content taken down? We have a help center. You go to facebook.com slash help, you type in words, and you'll be able to get resources. Last fall, we also redesigned our safety center because we got a lot of feedback from people on what information they needed. So we made it mobile friendly, made it available in over 55 languages, and have a bunch of videos which step by step will walk you through our various tools, features, and policies. 
It also has a section on resources where, where we've worked with local organizations around the world, we've developed guides, we've worked with partners, we've listed all these things there. So if you need more hyper-localized resources, you should be able to get them from our safety center. The other big feed piece of feedback we got was from parents that they felt really isolated in this journey. They didn't know how to have a conversation with their kids about online safety. So we developed a parents portal, which, which was a basic 101 on how do you stay <coughs> safe online. So we talked about resources. That was my third pillar. The fourth and the fifth pillar are actually super, super critical. And they, uh, according to me, you know, cut across everything that I just talked about. Partnerships and feedback. Making sure that we are working with the people who are in the field who are specializing on these issues. We may be created building a platform, but we don't know what sextortion, you know, what's going on. We don't know what the special needs of domestic violence victims are. We work very closely with organizations such as the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in the US, such as Center for Social Research in India. A whole bunch of organizations that keep us honest are our ear on the ground, tell us what more should we should be doing and you know where we need to strengthen our tools and our policies. So this is really fundamental for us getting this right. A couple of years back, one of the first things that I did when I took over my new role of Global Head of Safety Programs was we sent, we got out and we traveled the field and spoke to organizations and people working on women's issues. Not just women's safety online, but women's issues more broadly. We spoke to something like 150 organizations in that one year. We've continued those conversations, but that was a real eye-opener for us and helped us prioritize and think of things that we could be doing at a platform level to make a difference and to make, you know, give this as a safe space for women to have a voice, which is super critical for us. Um, I want to talk about a few of these tools that we launched as a result of these discussions and these conversations. The first one I want to talk about is our data bank for non-consensual sharing of intimate images. Other people may know this as revenge porn. We personally don't like that term. We call it non-consensual sharing of intimate images or the acronym NCII. One of the big pieces of feedback we got when we were having these conversations around the world, there was no country where we didn't hear this, was that if someone shared an intimate image of someone without their consent, it was one of the most traumatic experiences going. And this may not happen you know, very widely, but we felt as a company we could make a huge difference and start to think about solutions here. So one of the first things we launched was, uh, well, not one of the first things, one of the things we launched this year was a and you might have read this announcement, that now when you come to Facebook and you report and you tell us that this is an intimate image shared without your consent, we will add it to a data bank and we will use photo matching technologies so that no one can share this on any of our platforms, Facebook, Messenger, Instagram, ever again. And we thought this is just the first step. Why should you even go through that experience that someone shares this on the platform for you to come and report it to us? Could we do something at a more preventative level? If you're being blackmailed, if you're being sextorted, could we work with you somehow to get your images, add them to the data bank, and make sure that they aren't shared on any of our platforms? Now, obviously, that walked us into a lot of questions. And, you know, unfortunately, when you say Facebook and you say nude images, the headlines can be a little... I'm not going to, I'm going to let you all use your imagination. Um, but, you know, one of the things we did when we were developing and when we were thinking through this pilot, because this is a pilot, this is going to help us get a lot of feedback, which is going to inform our work in this space going forward. We need to know what the experience is like, how can we build this out at scale. Uh, and so we work with really trusted partners. We work with the National Network to End Domestic Violence in the U.S., Cyber Civil Rights Initiative in the U.S., YWCA Canada, the Australian E-Safety Commissioner's Office in Australia, and a bunch of other people you know, in these countries to try and take this first step. And this is just a first step. Um, and we are hoping that you know, people aren't turned off by the headlines. They still try and use this and help us to figure out how's the, what's the best way we can prevent the initial sharing of these images on our platforms. Because it, there has to be a better way of doing this. I'm going to stop talking about that, but if you all have any questions, I'm ha going to be around. I'm going to happy to take them. The second bunch of tools that I want to talk about was very specific to India. One of the big pieces of feedback, and I actually started working out working for Facebook in India for the first couple of years. And one of the big pieces of feedback that I used to get when I used to go out and talk to people was that people didn't like, you know, the sharing profile photos because they were concerned that people would download them create an impersonating, impersonating account, send friend requests to all of their friends and family, pretend to be them, spoil their image, and a lot of other issues. So this year we tested out something, which, or we launched something called, which we call the Profile Photo Guard. 
you can use this tool to add extra security to your profile picture. It's only available in India right now. Uh, and what it does is it basically gives you more control over who can download it, who can comment on it. Your profile picture is still public. Everybody can see it. But who, sh who should be able to get access to it, download it easily? We wanted to give people more controls. So that's an example of where we heard feedback in one specific country and are trying out tools specific to that country's needs. Just a few minutes back, actually, 29 minutes back, we announced a couple of new features on harassment prevention. One of them is based on a feedback that we received from a lot of women who we spoke to, that sometimes people come and they create accounts, fake accounts, impersonating accounts. They you know, reach out, they harass you, you report it, we take it down, they come up with a brand new account, and then another account, and another account, and another account. So we've been doing a lot of work at the back end, we call this recidivism. We've been doing a lot of work at the back end to see how can we stop this. And today we've announced new tools that we can help stop this person from reaching out again and again and setting up fake accounts. Um, so that's one of the two tools that we've announced. The other thing we've announced is on Messenger. And this was based on a lot of feedback from organizations working with domestic violence victims. That they didn't want to block the person, they didn't want to remove the person because that would aggravate the situation more. They wanted more controls where they could just ignore the person if the person sent them a message on Messenger so that it wasn't as disturbing to them. Uh, they would not, you know, blocking unfortunately meant that they would not be able to see what this person was doing in other places on Facebook. So they wanted to keep an eye on that person, but they just wanted to ignore their messages. And that's the second feature we've launched today. You don't need to block them, you don't need to remove them, you can just ignore it. That way, if you ever plan to go down the law enforcement path, you want to document some of the abuse that was coming to you, it'll always be in your other messages folder. It just won't be in your primary messages folder, so you, you can go back to it. Um, there are a lot of other things that we've launched the past couple of years based on this feedback. This is just to give you a flavor of how we went about looking at some of this feedback and trying to see how we could build tools that were scalable, that you know we could uh, launch globally or in certain markets. But we've also layered this with programs, with education, awareness, because a lot of people don't know they can report. A lot of people don't know that reporting is anonymous. What happens when I click report? Why aren't my reports getting reviewed? So we've launched these tiny videos which we've been putting into newsfeed. I don't know how many of you have seen them, which talk about what reporting on Facebook really is. We've been putting up these little education units on your newsfeed reminding you, have you taken the security checkup? Have you taken the privacy checkup? So we're trying to do a lot more intuitively in the platform uh, so that people have a lot more awareness about what are the po tools and policies available to them for their safety and security. We're also doing some great partnerships around the world, and I'm super proud of so many things that are be happening by, you know, where our partners are going in, having these conversations, uh, doing some incredible work. And I'm going to share just one example because I know I need to stop talking. Uh, so in India, there is an organization called the Center for Social Research. It goes into colleges around the country, and they do a program called Social Surfing, where they talk to young people and talk to them about using social media to give a voice to women's issues. Uh, but how do they stay safe while doing that? Making sure that they know all the tools and all the policies at their disposal, talking about counter speech, the value of counter speech, when to engage, when not to engage. And it's, it's an absolutely amazing program. I think this year they've done something like 75 colleges uh, around the country, which is, India is quite big. So it's really been fascinating to watch their journey on Facebook, see them going into classrooms and engage young people to have these conversations and give them agency and ownership of this space. But it's just the tip of the iceberg. This is to put things into perspective, we are, you know, at Facebook we have a poster which says the journey is just 1% done. This journey is just literally 1% done. We have a lot more we want to do and a lot more we are going to do, but we have started this journey. Thank you so much for those perspectives and I guess answering a question about the intermediary responsibility. Um, and now I promised we would have plenty of time to discuss, but I want to first give the panel right of questioning one another and then opening it up to all of us to have just a discussion about what else have we, are we missing out on. Many of you have probably been engaged in this discussion. Any new ideas coming up? Any strategies of engaging across the board, whether from civil society to government, uh, that we should learn about so that we can maybe leave here also just as encouraged? So first to the panel, anyone wants to react to anything or ask one another questions? Yes, no? Perfect. Amali. Just a very short uh, thing. 
um, because you were mentioning that uh, you have talked with uh, hundreds of organizations and activists working on women's issues, just to make an, a, cl a clarification. You have not done it with Latin American, and I'm sure of that because I was invited to a meeting with Facebook, and it was an, uh, a, a meeting in Washington with people from United States and from Canada, I was completely like, what is this? This is not our contest. We were only four persons from Latin America. We actually already uh, spoke with Antigone and we are in touch with the team, the Latin American team, but just to make that clarification, you did not have one meeting with Latin America. So we just made amends, just last, I think it's still on. We just made amends. I was in Mexico uh, last month and we met with a whole bunch of organizations from the region. Again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I want to be super, super clear. We, the journey has just started for us, but we did make amends. We went down to Mexico just two months back, met with uh, over, I think, 30 organizations in the room working on a range of issues, women's safety organizations, uh, child safety organizations, suicide prevention organizations, to hear from them and get feedback from them and you know continue the conversation. So it has started. Mm -hmm. Just another reply. That's not exactly the, <laughs> the meeting we are asking for. And we already talked with people from the Latin American team because that's not the meeting. We were, don't want to focus on child, for example. It's another issue, child safety, than women's issue. Uh, so that's not exactly the meeting we are asking for. And it was not a Latin American. It was Mexican, basically, with a few other organizations. So. <laughs> Make sure that we get that on the calendar. And I guess it's just a reminder that consultation, inclusivity, and the whole multi-stakeholder blah, blah, blah is tricky. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I've, I've gone to so many sessions so far, and it's being left at a dialogue thing, uh, getting people in the room, how it actually works out, and I guess it's always a constant struggle, but I guess this is just a reminder that when you say you want, it's not just a tick box measure to say this area, no one person, I can't sit here and speak for an African perspective, never ever, uh, or ask anyone else here to speak of any perspective rather than that which they're comfortable to do, but it also does highlight the challenge of actually how do you consult, how we actually enforce diversity, um, and I guess this is a great segue, unless anyone else wants to ask a question from this side, to hear from you guys around any strategies you've seen out there that maybe hold promise uh, or new challenges um, that we need to be aware of so that we all just leave here you know, with a bit more insight. Um, I don't know if we have anyone who's from any government law enforcement side of things, because it's always very tricky to get their perspective and conceptualization of this. But um, for those of us who are in the room, I'd love just to hear what else you'd have to add to this discussion. So by a show of hands, and we can get this show on the road. Gayatri, perfect. Hi, my name is Gayatri. I just have one uh, question, and maybe I think to those who had discussed the legal framework and uh, in the interest of uh, the intermediary li liability, I guess, in that sense. Um, I think my main concern uh, in terms of uh, addressing some of these problems, and you're absolutely right to talk about how the existing laws tend to take a very sort of benevolent, we have to protect the morality of women as uh, an approach currently. Um, and I think that that is something that uh, the private companies need to, to look at because I think up till today, it's always been, well, we'll you know, work according to the laws of the country and where the laws of the countries are very problematic in, in, in you know, the rest of the world, so to speak. Um, so I think, you know, maybe just a quick question about how much, how proactive the companies are and also if there are civil society groups who are able to make that links with the private companies to say, well, I think it's not enough to say according to the laws of the, the countries because it is hugely uh, problematic. So uh, I'm sorry I don't have a strategy per se, but I think this is where we find maybe the biggest challenge in, in trying to also make recommendations that would work for individuals, communities, societies, but also challenge the structure that is existing uh, at the same time. Thank you. Uh, so I can speak for Facebook and there are a couple of things. First is that we actually have a set of global community standards that apply globally, you know, regardless of the local law. We do respect local law and we do take, you know, we do work with local law requirements, but we, our community standards are global and they apply across the platform. We have been working with, uh, in different countries, not everywhere, again, you know, it's 
a lot. There's a lot that we could be doing, but we have started working, for instance, in the US, I can speak because I'm based out of there, uh, on a lot of the legislations for NCII. Uh, so we've been supporting a lot of those legislations. Uh, so we do, you know, and I can't speak to efforts in the whole world. I'm not a lawyer and, uh, you know, I don't have those details, but that this is something that we do continuously, um, you know, look at and work with. And we work with local organizations sometimes. They come to us and they say, hey, can you, you know, like, work with us on advocating for this, so yes. Uh, um, my name is Leticia, I'm from Brazil too. Uh, and I want to, um, the technical area, it's not my, my point, but I want to understand, you talk about uh, that databases that um, in the Facebook, that if you have uh, some Im image, intimacy image that was sharing, they, and I don't know, they um, don't let it be shared. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They, is it um, can be applied to screenshots too, because once in the net, mm -hmm. <laughs> I saw a lot of persons that, that have this problem, they post a photo, uh, not posted, now it has been uh, shared by someone mm -hmm. uh, she don't let sh share mm -hmm. this photo and take can take it off, okay? But uh, other other mm -hmm. people uh, have been screenshotted, and th this is a huge problem. I want to know if these databases can include mm -hmm. that, and I want to make a um, uh, suggestion, and I think that is very important. I think that the the terms and conditions from the uh, the Social media can be changed, a new format like opt in and opt out. Mm -hmm. Because some of these uh, apps, or I don't know, s some of these uh, digital digital pages, um, this it has um, um, uh, they they are, I don't know I don't know how to talk this, but you you download. And it's in understand that you already agreed with mm -hmm. all the terms, mm -hmm. but it's not like this. This is one yeah. one way to um, overcome this, this issue. I yeah. think. No, I think that's really really great. Uh, bo you know, both the questions were really great. Let me talk about the first question first, which is you know the data bank for photo matching technologies. So right now there are only two spaces that you know we are like you know uh, on the safety side. So one of them is for called photo DNA, which we use on the child safety uh, or known images of child sexual abuse. That any time you know, a photograph is uploaded on the platform, it is scanned against a known data bank of hashed images. Think of them as thumbprints. You know, uh, so the images are no longer stored. It's just the thumbprint of that image. It's just a bunch of code. It's scanned against that known data bank of hashed images. And if that image is found to be known CEI, it is taken down and we have to report it to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. We have to make sure that, you know, we inform them that this image is being shared so that they can go behind the person who's sharing it and, you know, uh, bring them to justice. And now we're trying this out on the photo safety side for intimate images. So right now it's just like a, you know, starting phase of seeing, you know, it's quite complex because, you know, the data banks, as big as they get, the slower the service gets and all of that. So uh, we're just starting to look at it on intimate images. And again, we don't store the image, we just sh store the thumbprint of that image and, you know, that's how uh, uh, it works on the back end. So right now we don't, we're not doing it with screenshots because, you know, it's just the starting of it, but I can see this conversation growing in the years to come. Um, when it comes to, you know, the opt-in and the opt-out, that is really good feedback and we learned along the way. Initially when we were starting new features on Facebook, we would keep them open, you know, we learned along the way that it, it's a better way is to make them opt in, like, you know, rather than keep them on by default. So now, for instance, when you do sign up for Facebook and sign up for an account, by default, like your post will share friends only. Uh, and a lot of these t tools we actually started developing on the teen safety side. It's so ironic because we started building these things for keeping children safe, and then we realized there's actually a huge, everybody needs this by default. So we've learned over the years and we've started making more and more things, uh, you know, by default of you come, you opt in for them. Um, and that's, and I can speak for Facebook, that is our policy right now. Mm -hmm. I actually wanted to respond to the uh, point that uh, Gayatri raised uh, earlier. So I think that uh, at any point, loss 
they basically ref they have to reflect like culturally what seems acceptable and not acceptable at any given point of time in a society and this we know is a constantly moving uh, target and we work and you know it's like a slow animal and it takes time to move and we have to engage with that but because we get frustrated when we engage with that is it really the option to say that uh, we kind of give up on that and we kind of work on other means i'm not so sure and i also think that uh, it it is true that uh, platforms such as facebook or twitter or anything else there may be terms of service and there may be things that users opt in voluntarily or do not opt in and that's one part of the equation but there are also things like public harm right and the state and in every state there's like a particular history of like approaching or defining public harm and moving with that uh, i think even in the area of gender ba based violence it becomes important to engage with national laws and try to change them i think that fight is equally important that is all Anyone else from before? Okay, perfect. And then we'll come back. My name is Esther. I'm with ISOC Youth at IGF. I want to thank you all for all the work you're doing and the feedback you're giving us. Uh, I had a question. She mentioned in Brazil that they, are, they have legislation uh, for about, this, about women's rights online. Now, I want to refer to my country, Zambia. And I feel like it's very difficult for grassroots organizations like mine, which I'm working on, Safety First for Girls, to have a say in, in policies regarding online rights for women. So there is really a huge, it's a very difficult to get to government level and propose these policies. So what can we do where there's no transparency, no openness, for governments like ours, for grassroots organization and youths like me to propose policies and be part of the process. Thank you. What an excellent question that I think is open to anybody on the panel and on the floor to answer uh, based on maybe people who've had that past experience as well. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. My name is Sandra Pepra, and I'm from the National Democratic Institute. Um, just to say we had a, a very similar conversation uh, on this issue um, uh, just a few minutes ago. And I suppose the thing that strikes me is, again, we're having these conversations in, in kind of silos. Is there somebody or some way to join us all up? Uh, because I think our uh, there's two things. First of all, work at the national level and work also at the international level and our advocacy with the um, uh, internet platforms would benefit from a, a more coherent uh, set of recommendations particularly. Uh, and I think also there is um, some way in which those with, if you like, less power and less agency can get supported by those with much more. Uh, and, you know, Amalia, uh, I love her because, you know, she just doesn't let anything slide. <laughs> and she will go after you until you've answered her question, which is great. But I'm, I'm um, expecting or uh, indicating that perhaps you could do with a bit more of that support. And how do we join this up in ways that go forward? Um, I think there's also the other bit of the equation is around the whole issue about how we do protect um, and really meet the ambition of an open and inclusive internet. Um, so it's not just, if you like, in the, in the wheelhouse of the individual's rights piece, but how important is this space for some of the other values that we all hold dear? I, mean, I come from a democ democracy organization, so how important is that space for um, uh, conversations and political discourse around uh, some of the values that we um, want to uh, promote and support and our political action as well. Um, I'll step in there and try and also just address that question based on also my reflection, having worked at what would be considered grassroots organizations and now more global and civil society. The power of networks and where they can be formulated, and I must say like all of us here, um, 
I would, I mean, not to the exception of Facebook, but in, sometimes in conjunction with organizations like Facebook, we're trying to come together and just have a voice. We may not be able to say that um, as Women's Rights Online Network that uh, we'll be able to be representative per se, but what we're trying to show is that it's not, it, you're not a crazy one individual on the ground that the policy will, you know, policy makers will shut down. And the lessons I think we've learned is even just supporting one another is everything, as you were saying. Um, with limited resources, we've tried our best to have research approaches that people can use, um, advocacy strategies that you can borrow from one another to address various aspects of gender and ICT. Um, and also trying to find access to these policymakers, as we rightfully are saying. It's ironic that um, for many of us, especially uh, from certain parts of the world, you have to come to Geneva to try and find your policymaker. You will not get airtime in their office. It's absolutely true. But to you, also to the, your reflection on who brings us all together, I think the work by the new special rapporteur um, on this issue will be very important, and I hope as many as of us here have contributed to it, because I think it's the UN system and why we keep coming back even sometimes though we feel like why we're here is it has that convening power. So there's been, I think, uh, an opportunity for all of us to share what has been working, what hasn't, and the way it will be re replicated or rather um, packaged and put back will also help all of us to see what has been working in other contexts where uh, strategies can go forward. But um, I'll just, I'll be happy to touch base with you later and talk more about how we've been working together in conjunction and really trying to strike at the heart of policy, trying to figure out whom, with whom do we partner to bring the policy makers into the room um, and to have them engage proactively. And gender and ICT is such a difficult topic to get any government types to think about. They're like, see the women's department. But this is a societal issue, it is a political issue. So we're happy to try and get more people on the ground so you're not alone, is all I was gonna say, yes. Just one very small comeback. I mean, one of the very practical things we could all do um, is make sure that we read the transcripts from the, other, uh, from the other panels because there'll be something in them and I've been to two today at least where um, I've learned things, so that's one thing. And then the second thing, and I would say this, wouldn't I, is, Come on, a whole lot more of you have got to go into politics. Really, we need, we need you actually in the political space because that's the way we know we get positive policy outcomes for women. We need women, yes, in civil society, yes, we need women in the Femocrat space, you know, the women's commissions, but we also need the women reps. So um, that's my call to all of you because I'm old and gray now. So uh, really, I expect you to, to move forward and, and take that space and really uh, make it your own. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll take yeah, your question and Joanna will also intervene. Hi, my name is Joanna. It's not a question, just i like to share some thoughts. I'm from Brazil and I'm not from social civil society. I'm from the academic, I'm a researcher. And we are, uh, uh, making a project uh, to help uh, to protect women from violence online, online violence. This, pro this program is called EP School Facing the Violence, the violence Against Women, Young Women. We work at the schools with the we, uh, we, girls with between 15 and 17 years old, uh, teaching them how to program app applications and also bring some digital literacy because it's very important. The numbers of violence is terrible in Brazil. And then in the last two, during the last two years, it's 130 girls suicide themselves just because of exposition online. So this is terrible. But also the digital literacy is a huge problem. Imagine the most young girls that we, f we talk, that we interview, we, made f we are doing group focal groups in all whole Brazil they think that internet are Facebook. The most of the, it's not a problem, it's not a problem using Facebook, but it's a huge problem to think that internet is only Facebook. The opportunities that people think this girl, they, they have a lot of opportunities internet, this is a lie. They don't have it. They are huge on Facebook and WhatsApp and just because of zero rating, just because of that, because they don't have, they don't have like money to pay the, the the internet, so they use this, for example, they don't play, they don't use games, they don't go to the outdoor sites, just Facebook and and uh, WhatsApp. So I think this is, we, we, I, we think it's very important to try to, to, to work close to the government. We prepare a, something like a plan to develop with government. We are trying to, 
make this a uh, public policy, but it's very difficult. It's not it's complicated. But uh, some some things we 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 made some progress we made because now we do this project in five series cities in brazil so let's see if the government make this like a, a police pub, uh, public policy per to the whole country just a few comments uh, for, first on just to agree uh on the issue to involve the community those two reports that we built uh for the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, the, both the national and regional one, uh, they were done in the, with a community uh, effort, and it was amazing uh, what we could uh, understand about the, the process, because we know, we know it's an issue, we know it's a hard one, and a multi-stakeholder uh, one to, to solve it, but also we, we needed to understand it better so we could hack it, you know? if, even if the governments or the platforms are not gonna solve it completely, we need to hack it and the hacking would also come from building a community. And by building a community, can, it can also be a way to produce counter discourse together and counter attack, you know? not only depending on the big players. Um, Thank you for all the, the clarifications about Facebook. I see that it, all, all the measures are uh, pretty much involved with uh, an idea of security, like increasing the, the security. Uh, but still, it's very locked in within Facebook. So we don't know exactly what's going on. So I'm, I'm, I have trouble with two things. The, the the due process, we still don't understand when a content is taken down or not, and do not have a, a way to appeal. Uh, and uh, really, like, I have been, as an organization in Brazil that talks about gender and digital rights, people that are, are being attacked do reach us, and we are, it's always a mess, <laughs> because we don't, we, it's not our court, thing we do give them digital security but then calling Facebook and say can you take this down this can you take up this is like it's not my role and uh, so we need to do process and we need transparency on what's going on on both sides and about the diversity and uh, in the talks that uh, Amalia mentioned I also think it's uh, th those kind of meetings if they are done in Latin America when they are, they should also include not us, the, ju just the digital rights people. Because in the end, we are like intermediaries in this conversation. Because luckily, so far, I haven't been attacked uh, so much. You know, there are people like on the ground that will bring, um, we are happy to uh, congregate in uh, the cases that come to us, but also they have other uh, points to make. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. And you know, just to talk about a couple of things that we are doing on our side to help close the loop and give like more information to people on when we take down content and why we are taking down, I want to talk about some of the things that we are doing. Um, so just to take a step back, how does reporting work on Facebook? Uh, because there are a lot of myths about you know why we don't take down content. It's quite a frustrating process because people don't have so much information about it. When you click on the report function at Facebook, we actually ask a series of questions. Why do you think this shouldn't be on Facebook? And you then give us some information. Shouldn't be on Facebook because it's embarrassing, because it's vile, you know, it has uh, somebody's thinking about committing suicide, or what is the reason why you think this should not be on Facebook? What that helps us do is really triage these reports and figure out who's the best person these reports should go to. So we have teams of trained specialists who will look at these reports based on the theme that you've selected, but these people are also trained across our community standards. So it's not just because my, you know, say my su subject matter expertise was NCII. When the report comes to me, if it's not a violation of NCII, but if it's a violation of some other policy, I should still be able to take the correct action and take down that piece of content. One of the big pieces of feedback and one of the things that we've been working on is making sure that we have native language reviewers. So we have over 40 languages that we cover full time. So 
we know that just because I speak Spanish, I should not be reviewing content in Spanish because I lack local nuances, I lack what's going on in local context. So we want to make sure we have native language speakers reviewing these reports when they're coming in. Uh, our international headquarters is in Dublin, and the joke there is that every Monday is an induction for all the new team people. And it's one of the most diverse rooms you'll walk into because we're trying to get more and more languages, more and more representation onto these teams in terms of reviewers. So the other big piece of feedback we received is, I've clicked report, Facebook, of course, has missed the ball again. They've not taken down the content. There are a few reasons why these errors happen, and I want to walk through some of them. One of them is, when you've clicked on report, what have you reported to us? Have you reported the whole group, the whole page, the whole account, versus the posts that you think that Facebook should be looking at, versus the very comment where the problem lies? Because it's like a hunt for a needle in a haystack for the person who's reviewing it if you don't get very specific about what they want us to see. The second reason why we may make a mistake is because many times we don't have the context on what's going on there. You've reported something because someone has you know, put up a pink rose on your page. We don't know why it shouldn't be on your profile. And then you know, our work with domestic violence victim advocates have taught us that sometimes this is a way of needling the domestic violence victim, like you know, giving them like a prod saying, I'm, I've got my eye on you, I'm looking at you. So how do we even build for those experiences where we don't have that context and we can't take the correct action? We want to make sure that we are building tooling to complement those experiences, giving you the ability to ignore their messages, block them, remove them, delete them, report them if it's a fake account. Um, and I've lost my train of thought, but I'm going to try and <laughs> capture it again. <laughs> uh, so, th so that's the second reason why we would you know, probably make an error, because we don't have the additional context. Sometimes it's also aggravated, you know, like the trolling behavior, where it's like coming, you know, bits and pieces to you, but the report is coming to, at, to us at an isolation. So we don't know big picture what's going on behind the scenes, so we don't take the action which you think we should have taken. This is feedback we've received. This is feedback we're looking at and thinking, what more could we be doing there? But we think tools can really help in the near term in terms of giving people the control over who can reach out to you and what they can do on the platform. So this is to respond to the question on, you know, uh, who's reviewing these transparency on them. One of the big pieces of feedback, has Facebook even looked at my report? What action have you taken? Why, you know, why did you decide to take that action? So we're trying to give you messages, so you'll receive a notification when you've submitted a report to Facebook, or you can go to facebook.com slash support, which is your support inbox, and see what's the status of the report. What action did Facebook take? Why did it take it? On the reverse side, if someone's reported your piece of content, we want to make sure that you get a notification saying that someone's reported something that you've posted, which violates our community standards. To find out more about our bullying policies, click here, go here. In some instances, we are trying out the whole you know, appraisal process where you can click to say, if you think Facebook has made a mistake, go here and let us know. Uh, it's work in progress because the scale of things, because we lack, con it's just, pretty complex, but that's something which we are committed to trying to do more and more of. The other thing we're trying to do with the support inbox experience is give people more local, real-time support. So if I have an intimate image that has been shared on Facebook, it's probably been shared on other places on the web. So the moment that you report this to us, even before we've reviewed it, can we give you a response back saying, hey, you've reported an intimate image to Facebook. We are reviewing your report. Meanwhile, here are some local organizations in your country who you could reach out to for help and support because we know it's not just happening on our platform. Could we be doing more with that? It's super sophisticated because sometimes people report content to us saying it's bullying, uh, but when you look at it, it's got some other you know things playing around to it. Uh, so it's, it's hard to get the messaging absolutely accurate and not aggravate the person who's reporting it more, make them feel like we are being tone deaf and not listening to them because we're doing it at scale. So that's something which we are investing a lot in and seeing how can we get better and better at the responses that we are giving. Meanwhile, it's I want to thank you because people like you who are on the ground, who are taking those painful phone calls and you know um, letting Facebook know that we've goofed up or we've not done the right action helps us out because even those isolated incidents, we can see a pattern and see where are we not taking the right action? Is there something that we're doing wrong consistently that we should be fixing at the back end? Maybe the policy is in the right place, but the enforcement of it is not in the right place. So that helps us out tremendously. There is a team looking at the reports and looking at what we, what we need to fix on our side. Maybe, maybe you know, we need to be doing more on you know, that policy or that enforcement. So thank you for that. So I'm gonna stop there, but. <laughs> yes. We have time for one last intervention before we wrap mm -hmm. up. Yeah. Just very, very quick questions and, uh, to build on uh, your questions on transparency. Um, I'm Valerie, by the way. I'm from the uh, OHCHR. 
Um, quick question on the community standards. I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this question, but uh, on what uh, principles or basis were, were these standards uh, built upon and what was the process of building those community standards? Um, and also the second question on the consultations that you held with uh, civil service organizations, et cetera, were there outputs from those meetings that could be circulated? Because they have potential to inform further conversations or even uh, processes that other organizations are uh, conducting. And I'd, I personally quite like to see what, uh, what came out of those consultations and what you're basing your current processes on, if that's possible. Okay, I'm gonna try and address this as best as I can. So to answer your last question in terms of, you know, do we have like, you know, what things came out of those consultations, that's pretty much the tools that we talked about. And the way that we try and communicate them is put up newsroom posts. So the, Facebook has a newsroom, and once you go into the newsroom, you'll be able to see all the latest things that we have announced. And of course, we're announcing a lot right now because we are working on many different fields. So sifting through those and finding out the ones which are the most relevant to you is gonna be quite a chore. Uh, sometimes we have small close groups of people who we've met in country who we wanna go back to and say, thank you for your advice. It wasn't in vain. Here are some things that we worked and developed on. So we do have, we wanna try and close the loop with the organizations we've consulted to say that we really, really have, you know, taken their feedback and worked on it. Uh, so it's not, you know, open, it's not, it's the organizations that we've worked with, we're trying to close the loop with them. Um, and your first question was about community standards and, you know, how we came up with those and, you know, what is the thinking behind those? So if, I don't know if you've had a chance to see facebook.com slash community standards. We're trying to be as transparent as possible to talk about what our community standards are, what are the principles behind those community standards. We won't go too granular because people sometimes game the system after getting to know a lot of details, <laughs> but we want to give you the spirit of the policy. What does it really stand for? What does it mean for? Um, we are also doing a lot of work internally to see how much more we could be sharing without you know, like putting the policy in a place where it's not enforceable anymore. So that's something which we are you know, currently contemplating on how do we talk more about our policies in a responsible way. One way that we are doing that is something called the hard questions at Facebook. So I don't know if you've seen these. We've started launching a series of these on topics where we, where there are super, super difficult decisions that we've had to make on community standards, and we want feedback from people to tell us where, whether they think we've landed in the wrong place, in the right place, what more could we be doing? So we've released one, for instance, uh, which is a super hard one for me to read on our policies around memorialization. When somebody dies, what should happen with their account? Should, with people, you know, if they've given us legacy contacts, told us who their account should go to, it makes our life a lot easier. But a lot of people don't know that they can do that on Facebook. So what should we be doing in that instance? Uh, it's a super hard one for me, for me to read personally, but there are a lot of, you know, questions that we put out there. Uh, and we are taking more and more feedback openly through these hard questions, so we'll give a theme We'll talk about where we are on that policy, why we are there, and we'll give an email address so that you can email us and tell us, uh, you know, where you think that we are dropping the ball or where you think we could be doing a different, doing it differently. So that's one way that we are opening up the dialogue, and hopefully we'll have a lot more ways that we can open it up. Thank you so very much. Uh, we're coming to the end of the time we have allocated for us, and I feel like I must really thank you for being here. You could have been at the equals party, what's going on, <laughs> but this speaks to some dedication. This was a slot we were allotted, um, and I just want to just conclude by saying that, you know, there's still the real challenge of engaging policy and policy makers on these issues, and that's something we're really trying to preoccupy ourselves with a, a women's rights online network that all of us are a part of, and that we coordinate at the Web Foundation. Um, if you have any ideas, any strategies, please feel free to reach out to Web Foundation, IT for Change, Mido, um, Fundacion Carisma, Coding Rights. We want to compile those and be able to amplify best practices. And as also we try and do our advocacy work on the ground, especially trying to engage with policymakers, we are trying as, as much as possible to share stories about how that's working. So there's a toolkit of strategies, if ever. And you know, it's long term, but thank you so much for being here. And we'll continue the discussion using our women's rights online. Thank you very much.